Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening, depending on where you're joining this webinar. Welcome to LM News Special International Business Lecture Series. My name is Young Sun Pak. I'm a professor of international business and management and director of the Center for Asian Business, as well as the Center for International Business Education at the College of Business Administration at Loyola Marymount University in Los Angeles, California. This program is funded by DK Kim Foundation a gracious benefactor of the Center for Asian Business for past six years, and also sponsored by the LMU Center for International Business Education. The Center for Asian Business was established in 1995 to promote better understanding between the US and Asian countries through multiple channels, including international business courses, faculty research grants, student scholarships, special lectures, and movie screenings. LMU is among the 16 universities in the country awarded the very prestigious Center for International Business Education grants from U.S. Department of Education. The LMU Center for International Business Education serves as a regional as well as national resources to students, faculty, and business practitioners through international business and area study education foreign language training and research capacities. I don't know how many of you are familiar with the history and geography of China, Japan, and Korea. They are very close neighbors. I always tell my students, you need to learn the history of a country to develop a good business relationship and make profit. Learning history means you've come to understand people and their culture. China, Japan and Korea are number two, number three, and number 10 economies in the world. They share a very long and complicated history. I thought a brief explanation of modern history starting from late 19th century will help the audience understand better the context of today's webinar topic. Japan defeated China in the first Sino-Japanese War, which occurred 1894 because of conflict between the two countries to claim supremacy in Korean Peninsula. The Japanese influence over Korea kept increasing after this victory and Korea was eventually annexed to Japan in 1910 and remained a colony of Japan for 36 years until 1945 when Japan was defeated in World War II. Japan invaded China in late 1930s and established a puppet government in Manchuria after Nanjing Massacre, which refers to mass killing and ravaging the Chinese, occurred in 1937 during the Second Sino-Japanese War that preceded World War II. Although Korea and China normalized the relationship with Japan, they still have unresolved issues from the colonial past such as reparations to comfort women, the victims who serve as Japanese soldiers, or forced labor who are drafted to work in the factories and mines in brutal conditions to support the war for Japan. There are also unresolved territorial disputes between Japan and China, as well as Japan and Korea. Japan argues that 1965 treaty that restored diplomatic relationship and provided more than $800 million has settled these matters. However, Korea does not completely agree that the 1965 deal resolved all the problems related to their colonial past. To summarize, the lingering historical animosity between China, Japan, and Korea have often kept troubled relations despite their geographical proximity, similar cultures, and close economic ties and made it difficult for these three countries to work together. The conventional wisdom would be that you need to find common agenda or group identity like Asians to overcome conflicts among individual countries. However, our speaker today, Professor Chung, suggests a new and insightful approach focused on national identity. So I'm very excited to learn about this new perspective. Now, I'd like to introduce our moderator, Professor Jennifer Ramos will lead the dialogue with Professor Chong. 
Dr. Ramos is Chair of Political Science and International Relations at Loyola Marymount University. Her research focus is on understanding the causes and consequences of political change with an emphasis on the role of ideas, norms, and identity. Her current research interests include peace building in divided societies, the globalization of the far right, and the preventive use of force. With a passion for international relations, she has lived, worked, researched, and studied a number of countries, including the Netherlands, Austria, France, Germany, Croatia, and Mexico. Her recent experiential learning courses include immersion trips to the United Nations in New York to study human rights and to Belfast, Northern Ireland to examine the process of peace and reconciliation. Professor Ramos, floor is yours. Would you please introduce our speaker, mm -hmm. Professor Chung? Great, thank you so much, Professor Pak. I'm really honored to be here tonight to be in conversation with Dr. Unbin Chung. Um, let me just say a few words of introduction about her. Um, she really is this amazing dynamic scholar. We're so glad that she's here with us this evening. She's an assistant professor of political science at the University of Utah. Dr. Chung earned a PhD from the Ohio State University and a master's degree from the London School of Economics and Political Science. Dr. Chung's research interests include international security, conflict resolution, and political psychology. Her work has been widely published in a number of top political science journals, and her research has also been supported by a number of high-profile organizations, including the Korea Foundation, the Japan Foundation, the Academy of Korean Studies, and the European Union Chamber of Commerce in Korea. So tonight's conversation is going to highlight her new book, 2022, called Pride Not Prejudice, National Identity as a Pacifying Forest in East Asia. Uh, and it has already garnered a lot of accolades. So just to name some from our American Political Science Association, she's won the Best Dissertation Award in Experimental Methods, Best Dissertation Award in Political Psychology, and from another organization, the International Society of Political Psychology, Dr. Chung's work also won Best Dissertation Honorable Mention. So on behalf of LMU, CBA, and the Center for International Business Education, Please help me give a warm welcome to Dr. Unbin Chung. There we go. There um, you are. I'll so try. yeah. Let's Thank start you. with a foundation question or questions just to kind of orient our audience with your research before we get into a little more details. Um, so can you maybe please discuss the origins of your research question, your main argument, and the contribution you're seeking to make in the literature? I absolutely can. And um, perhaps it would be um, better for me to answer that question with the help of some uh, slides I have prepared. So I'll just go ahead and try to share my slides right now. Okay, that's great. Um, so um, before I, I answer that question specifically, I would <laughs> I would like to thank Dr. Paik and Dr. Ramos for the incredibly generous introduction. Um, I am extremely honored and pleased to be here. I would also like to extend my gratitude to Dr. Marky Jones for helping to put this talk together, as well as the Center for Asian Business uh, DK Kim Foundation Lecture Series and the Center for International Business Education at LMU. And last but not least, I thank everyone here and all of you listening <laughs> for a warm welcome and for joining us today. Um, so uh, the first question from Dr. Ramos was uh, a question about the origins of my research question um, and uh, my main argument. Um, and I would love to share these with you. As a scholar, I study the international relations of East Asia especially the relations between Korea, Japan, and China. And I choose these as a case where the historical memory of conflict and colonialism inhibits cooperation today. Besides macro level political and economic reasons to study peace and cooperation in Asia, I also had some personal motivations. 
When I was a university student in South Korea, I was lucky to have the opportunity to study abroad in Japan. And I had an amazing time in Japan. I lived with a very kind Japanese family and I was part of an excellent student exchange program where I made many friends from Japan and elsewhere. So at this point, my personal affinity levels of Japanese culture and people were quite high. But still, it was hard to ignore the fact that Korea had much ongoing tension with Japan due to the country's turbulent history. After return returning to Korea, I had a chance to attend something called a suyujipe, and this can be translated into Wednesday demonstrations. Every Wednesday, the few surviving comfort women in Korea gather in front of the Japanese embassy in Seoul for weekly protests. Many of these women are now in their 80s or 90s, and they gather no matter how hot or how cold the weather might be to demand compensation from the Japanese government. Observing these assemblies, I became even more motivated to find ways to overcome these lingering issues of unresolved conflict between the countries. Following these experiences, I specifically went to Europe for graduate school. Now, this was in the early 2000s, ages ago, when Europe was experiencing the so-called heyday of regional integration, many years before Brexit. I wanted to learn from the European experience. Some people said, hey, look at Europe in comparison to Asia. European countries also share a complex history of many wars, yet they are united together under a common European identity, now in an organization called the EU, which makes future conflict between members unthinkable. Based on this idea, many people say national identities are too strong in Asia and they are an impediment to peace. Some scholars think we should downplay or submerge the existing national identities and replace them with something more common and universal. So for example, rather than distinctively being Korean, Japanese, or Chinese, people should more strongly identify as Asians, holding an overarching common Asian identity. However, from what we are witnessing in our world today, the erosion of national identities is just not feasible. First of all, we live in an age of nationalisms. Even with globalization, we have not seen a decline in national identities. They're stronger than ever. So why not focus on their positive effects? Also, national identities are deeply ingrained in people's minds. We're socialized into them from a young age. Oftentimes you can't just pick and choose to replace national identity overnight with a larger identity. People won't easily become part of one big happy family, especially when they don't even like each other enough to work together. Finally, people want some sense of belonging. Integrating into a larger group through a weakening of current identities is risky in that it has a possibility of backfiring. Since national identities are deeply ingrained in people's minds, any attempt of integration or replacement of identity faster than people are comfortable with can pose a threat to people's ontological security and cause harsher resistance. Working together with someone else requires trust. The belief that others will reciprocate cooperation rather than exploit your vulnerability. Without this belief, suspicion preempts countries from working together, even if that means foregoing potential win-win benefit. So trust is the starting motor for cooperation. Because working together with someone else for future gains entails some vulnerability on your side, if you're fearful and uncertain of the other's intentions, 
then working together becomes a risk. So if there are some unrealized gains between your group and another group, how can you achieve these gains? How do you build the minimum necessary trust to work together? The conventional wisdom to installing trust between groups is to get rid of group identity. The theory of identity affirmation from social psychology, however, claims the opposite, that the solution is to build on identities to make them stronger and more salient. You see, identity affirmation theory is consistent with this idea, the confident man is the generous one, which means if you're content and secure about your self-worth and comfortable in your own skin, you become less defensive in your reactions towards others. Because you're less defensive, you're able to objectively process the benefits of working with other groups. It helps you move beyond the immediate hatred you see every day. To summarize, clarity and security in what it means to be, par to be part of your group lets you process the benefit of working together to achieve them, together with another group to achieve those gains. To test this theory of how identity affects trust with others, I visited the three countries to do field work. I worked with a large number of students at universities in each of these countries to conduct a survey experiment. I manipulated how strongly people were affirmed of their national identities. Then I measured the levels of trust they had toward the other countries to see if these two match up. So indeed, whether people with a strong sense of national identity trusted the other countries more. And I measured trust in two ways. First, by questions that directly asked how much participants trusted the other country. And second, with a game that has participants from different countries exchange money with one another. This game is called the trust game and is often used in economic style experiments to measure trust. The idea is that you would only give your money to another person if you trust them enough. And here are my results. As you can see in every condition, individuals who were affirmed of their national identities so those who had a stronger and more confident sense of their national identity, shown in blue here, gave more tokens to their counterparts in the trust game compared to individuals that were not affirmed of a strong positive national identity, shown in green. For the trust questions as well, as you can see in every condition, although I'm missing data from China for these questions in particular, Individuals who were affirmed of their national identity answered that they trusted the other country more compared to those that were not affirmed of their national identity. So national identity um, affirmation had positive effects across the two measures of trust, uh, the trust game and the trust questions. These findings support my theory that national identity affirmation can boost international trust, even between adversaries, the enduring rivalries. This implies that national identities can have a positive side to them, and we can thus potentially steer them in a positive direction. Furthermore, getting rid of national identities is not necessary for peace and cooperation in Asia. What are the policy implications of this study? I believe we are at a confused time in history when we're not completely sure of what to do with our current identities for peace. My findings suggest that peaceful coexistence doesn't have to involve an erosion of identities. 
Groups can thrive, flourish, and prosper in their differences, in their diverse and distinct identities, rather than having to assimilate into a homogenous group. These findings can also potentially be extended to domestic contexts of interracial and interethnic conflict and multicultural societies that struggle from internal divisions between groups with distinct identities. Dr. Chung, if I may, I don't want to interrupt you if you weren't finished with the answer there. Oh, but I was I was finished with my answer. Okay, perfect. <laughs> I just wanted to pick up on one point that you were talking about, and I'm wondering, is it that the folks are proud of their country or just satisfied with their well-being, like the political, economic, that helps explain the peace or relative peace between countries? That is an excellent question. Thank you very much. Um, and a very important point. So um, is it that folks are proud of their country or just satisfied where, with um, their political or economic status? Um, to examine this question uh, exactly, as well as test the general applicability of my theory, I estimated some tests with existing national survey data. So using data from a survey conducted by Seoul National University in South Korea, over the course of six years, I conducted two follow-up studies. In the first study, as a question that is closest to representing the idea of national identity affirmation, I chose the question of, how proud are you of your Korean national identity? Then I examined the correlation between responses to this question, excuse me, and how positive Koreans' perceptions were of some of the countries Korea shared the most complicated histories with. So the US, Japan, China, and Russia. So I wanted to see if people who were affirmed of their national identity, measured in this case by how proud they were of that national identity, held more positive perceptions of other countries. And results indicate that that is the case. The main independent variable capturing affirmation um, here, uh, the variable proud, is consistently positive and statistically significant. I also looked at alternative measures of one's subjective evaluation of political and economic development of South Korea over time. So if you see here, um, the democracy variable captures one's subjective evaluation of political progress in South Korea. And similarly, the econ satisfy variable captures one's subjective evaluation of economic development in South Korea. And the overall results are remarkably similar to the results we saw with uh, proud as the main independent variable. The, the results that I just showed you before. So those who assess Korea's political and economic progress in a more positive light tend to have more favorable attitudes toward the neighboring countries. That's so interesting, Dr. Chung. <laughs> Thank you. Um, I, I'll ask a few more questions and then we'll get the audience involved. I see there's already a question. Um, how about, you know, I'm thinking about material power here and given the rise in hostility in the region, like what is the role of material power in terms of or relative to this national identity affirmation? Because clearly there are power dynamics in East Asia that seem to be an important part of the context in which international relations play out. So I'm wondering, like, can national identity identity affirmations counteract these power realities? Thank you. That that is um, an excellent point. Um, so, given uh, the hostility and the role of material power in this region, um, how powerful can national identity affirmation be? Um, my answer to your question, 
I think, is related to the foundation of national identity affirmation theory. The theory is related to the idea that attachment to your country can have positive effects when the attachment, the in-group love, is purely inward looking um, rather than based on out-group hate. This is how identity affirmation works. So in my surveys, um, I told you that I manipulated um, how strongly participants were, uh, were affirmed of their national identity. The way I did this was just through this simple task. Um, so participants completed in my surveys this non-political task that just makes you feel good about yourself that in no way specifically entails comparison to the other party. There's not even another country that's mentioned here. Um, you are making yourself feel good in a way that does not put down the other or an outgroup. But as we all know, nationalism can be a double-edged sword. In contrast to national identity affirmation, uh, there's also something called national chauvinism. And chauvinism represents the negative side of nationalism. Chauvinism entails perceived superiority over another group. So you're specifically making yourself feel good about your so you're specifically making yourself feel good about your group by comparing your group to other groups, unlike affirmation. Could the role of material power or power realities have countervailing effects to affirmation? Um, it could be that in conditions where, for example, all three countries have state leaders or entrepreneurs with vested interests in keeping the hatred alive, affirmation effects could be limited. And I want to see if this was the case. So to test this, I replicated my study in the hardest case possible that I could think of. <laughs> so basically a current war zone where conflict and animosity is most salient. Uh, where do you think I'm talking about? Yes, I tested my theory in Ukraine. <laughs> And while the statistical analysis is incomplete, preliminary findings point to a positive direction, although not statistically significant. Future research can further explore and refine these scope conditions. Okay, great. Thank you. That is so amazing that you were able to do research in the Ukraine. <laughs> that is striking. Good for you. Um, so I just, just to follow up, how long are these national identity affirmations supposed to last or do we have to constantly be engaged in reaffirming the identity? Do you have a sense of how that works? Mm -hmm. That is a wonderful question. So if um, I manipulated the strength um, or salience of national identity in a survey experiment and then measured trust shortly after that, is there a possibility that affirmation here was just a priming effect or might they have longer lasting effects? Um, so um, to go back to uh, one of the policy implications of uh, my study, which I think will help answer this question, my study shows that we don't have to be too frightened about strengthening national identity, right? because it does not necessarily lead to outgroup hatred. And for this reason, we can be reasonably hopeful about the positive potential for national identity affirmation, especially if it can have lasting effects. <laughs> um, social psychologist Marilyn Brewer's famous punchline was, in-group love is not outgroup hate. Identity affirmation is consistent with the idea that we can certainly have in-group attachment without out-group hate. A common analogy here is children. Just because someone loves their children doesn't mean they hate other people's children, right? So a purely inward-looking in-group love that does not entail out-group hate, hate is possible. With regard to how long affirmation effects can last, research in psychology suggests an answer. Studies find that 
affirmation cultivates trust across racial lines and with lasting effects. So for example, a study of seventh grade minority students found that throughout a school year, minority students that were affirmed of their identity sustained greater trust in their teachers and school administrators and perceived fairness in their grades and treatment. By contrast, minority students that were not affirmed of their identity typically displayed a decline in trust in their teachers and school administrators. And they judged their grades and treatment as less fair and more biased at the end of the year than they had at the beginning. In other words, affirmation effects made a significant difference throughout the year, which indicates they might be more than a mere priming effect. I'm done with my answer. That's so interesting. Thank you, Dr. Chung. Um, I, I'm thinking we'll do one more question and then we go to the audience. There's a few questions waiting. I just wanted to see like, so where is this research going? Like, what are your next steps? Um, and sort of thinking about uh, how you can extend this and maybe um, policy implications of that or, yeah, I'm very curious to see where this goes. Thank you for asking that um, <clears throat> and for giving me the opportunity to discuss how my talk today fits in my larger research interests and goals, because that's directly related to where I want to take this project next. So in the project I introduced to you today, I focused on trust. In the future, I plan to extend my variables of interest beyond trust to see whether affirming group identities can improve emotional and behavioral aspects between groups as well. In my overall research, I'm interested in studying what we should do with our current group identities in order for groups to get along. In the context of international relations, which is my field, I ask, do we want a strengthening or weakening of national identities? My book, Pride Not Prejudice, was published last year by the University of Michigan Press. Open access, which means you can read the whole book online for free. <laughs> In the book, I ultimately argue that reinforcing national identity through an affirmation of what it means to be part of your country can increase trust, guilt recognition, and positive perception between countries. I also further expand on the policy implications of these findings. Great, thank you. I'm sure our students also appreciate that you chose to release it in that way, so it's free, so thank you. Um, we have some substantive questions here that I'd like to take from the audience. The first one is um, more directed towards the regional perspectives. Um, and for example, what would the future of Taiwan look like based on your research and national identity affirmation? Um, this question is saying, would Taiwan be able to achieve the coexistence it wishes with China without fear of being invaded? How would trust play a role in this situation? That is an excellent question. Uh, thank you for that. It's it's not an easy one to, <laughs> to answer either, <laughs> um, especially with uh, considering the particular circumstances and, uh, and the complexities of the circumstances that Taiwan is in, uh, could we apply this theory, which argues mm -hmm. you need to affirm your distinctive national identities for peaceful coexistence to Taiwan, especially if China might consider uh, a Taiwanese national identity a different thing, right? So from the Chinese perspective, I don't know if um, national identity affirmation can work both ways because of that difference in perception mm -hmm. uh, from internally within Taiwan, um, especially for Taiwanese that hold 
a stronger, more salient, more distinctive sense of national identity that is uniquely Taiwanese. Um, I think uh, this theory could be more applicable, but when we're talking about that effect working in a mutual direction, um, I think it might be a little more challenging just because of you know, the possibility that China might consider a Taiwanese identity to be part of a larger Chinese identity. Um, so how clearly from both sides can we distinguish the two national identities um, as distinctive and different, I think um, might change uh, the degree to which the theory can be helpful or applicable to this setting. Yeah, that makes sense. Uh, we have another really interesting question uh, that starts off with, you know, reminding us that Dr. Or Park ta ta started talking about the Asianness that's shared across the three countries and then asked, do you think the results of your research experiment would be different if one of the parties had more cultural distance from the others? Right. That is an excellent question. Thank you very much, Tom. Um, I actually think my results might be even stronger if there is more of a cultural distance because um, the idea is to emphasize unique and distinctive national identities um, so that you gain a greater sense of pride about who you are um, distinctively, right? Um, and not because some of some sort of shared larger identity you hold and share with the out group. So I think that might actually be a better case for, um, for this theory in particular. Uh, whereas if you have two or more groups that are already so integrated under an umbrella identity, it might be more challenging to emphasize a distinctive identity. So if you have groups that are already, you know, perhaps uh, different ethnic groups, let's say, for example, that both share a very strong sense of national identity within one country, then it might be a, a little more difficult to, um, to, you know, emphasize that sort of internal distinctiveness if you're already considered part of one group um, and that identity is solidified. So I think yeah, having some sort of cultural distance might actually work better for national identity affirmation. Oh, that's really interesting too. This other question is related and they're asking, does attachment to national identity cause more negative or positive affects? Seems like part of what you're saying is maybe it's the context that informs the answer to that, but I'll let you go ahead. Yeah, I'm so glad you, you asked this question, Michael, because it's a uh, very close to um, uh, what I think is a is a is a, a sensitive but very important distinction that I'm making in my project. And I think, am I still sharing my slides or am I not? No, not at this moment. Okay, so um, so I, I I I won't go back to my slides. But there was one where I made where I made clear or tried to make clear the difference between national identity affirmation and national chauvinism. Mm -hmm. So when you talk about mere national attachment and whether that can have a positive or negative effect, I honestly think it can go both ways, depending on what sources of national attachment you are emphasizing. Mm -hmm. So again, if you have state leaders, elites, or entrepreneurs, uh, or some people in power that have an interest in, again, keeping the hatred alive to say, mm -hmm. you know, we are, we have this national greatness and we're better in comparison to some other countries, then I think that kind of national attachment can be, can have toxic effects because that's closer to national chauvinism. Mm -hmm. um, again, I mean, nationalism is a double-edged sword and it's kind of a, it, nationalism has kind of become a dirty word today, right? It has a pretty yes. bad, um, yes. so it can mm -hmm. have the negative effects that we've seen throughout history. Um, I'm making the case that there is a positive side that you can divide from the negative side of national attachment, a, a love that is purely inward looking, uh, kind of like the attachment you would have to your family or your children that doesn't have to 
entail some superiority or, or over the other or some hatred um, against the other. And that sense of national pride, if stoked in uh, a correct way by elites to, who might have the incentive can have much more positive effects. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So I would say depending on the color and flavor of nationalism, it can have an opposite mm -hmm. effect. Sorry. Yeah, this sort of leads into the other question too about, you know, since there has been such a violent history in Asia in the 20th century, uh, this person would like to know, like, how do you reconcile your theory with the actual events of the era? Right. So um, Asian countries, thank you for your question, David. Asian countries definitely share a very turbulent history and many complicated interactions throughout that history. Um, so um, as much as we did have uh, many events of conflict and colonialism in the 20th century, I would argue that there have been some studies on a period uh, scholars have uh, called the so-called honeymoon period during uh, between China and Japan. And these were um, at a time where um, China was economically uh, um, you know, getting out of um, the, you know, after the Cultural Revolution and the more difficult times in Japan was, real, Japan's economy was really flourishing. Um, and at this time where we had the heightened sense of economic and political, perhaps more economic, uh, but economic mm -hmm. satisfaction, um, there was a sense of inward looking national pride. And it kind of felt like Leaders and people in both countries could now afford the, the psychological space um, to reach out and, um, you know, try to take more peaceful measures in international relations with one another. Um, so there were times where it seemed like, you know, there, uh, this might be a clue as to what national identity affirmation could look like in actual policy. Um, mm -hmm. So there were... Uh, um, students and scholars that came together to um, write history books together that both both sides could agree with. There was just a lot more um, effort going on for reconciliation to kind of help us move beyond the past. And as a, a suggestion, um, rather than othering each other um, in that are, uh, an outgroup that is coexisting, maybe we could other the past. So the idea is that we were better than how we were in the past. We're in this together to make sure that, you know, history won't repeat itself, um, but we're better together uh, compared to how we were in the past was kind of the idea. So um, when elites and people have that incentive and motivation, and I'm suggest suggesting national identity as the first nudge <laughs> towards uh -huh. Uh -huh. um, and it could be that reciprocated games of cooperation can follow afterwards. Uh, maybe uh, what we ne need is that initial nudge, that motivation. Um, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And then, yeah, and then more developments could follow, possibly. So then related to trust and national identity in the region, like how significant a factor is national identity in the mistrust between China and Japan or Korea and Japan, do you think? So how significant a factor is national identity? Um, so in, in East Asia, it's simply unrealistic for state leaders to abandon nationalism. Korea and Japan in particular are democracies and no leader saying we need to do away with nationalisms today <laughs> will gain public support. Uh, but when leaders perceive of some benefit of cooperation, but they face domestic opposition, national identity affirmation can be a way to, uh, again, move or nudge the extremely opposed opinions in the public in a more moderate direction. So I predict that national identity affirmation can be the motivation to make the first move uh, toward working together. Policy-wise, this could be more realistic than demanding a public apology from governments, um, an approach that has been unsuccessful in the region for decades. Uh, I guess just to follow up too on that, like 
what effects could increased trust between these countries have on actual policies of reconciliation or cooperation between the countries? Yes, I was interested in um, how this theory could affect the actual policies as well. Um, and since I don't have direct access to the elites making the policies, um, I, I tried to test uh, this question in, in a different way. So what effect um, can increased trust have on reconciliation policy, for example? And what actions can individuals take to move the region past uh, historical animosity and toward reconciliation? So um, to test this, I conducted a follow-up study just in Japan where I asked, which activities are you personally willing to participate in for reparation to either Korean or Chinese people? And this study is based on existing research uh, in which psychologists find that with national identity affirmation, Canadians accepted greater guilt and shame over how indigenous people were treated in Canada. And I find that national identity affirmation makes people more receptive to reparation. And this is done through increased trust as a mediator, which means national identity affirmation um, increases willingness to take reparative measures. And this is done through trust. We saw earlier that national identity affirmation boosts trust, right? This study adds to that to find the increased trust now leads to Japanese individuals' openness to endorse compensation. So trust was the mechanism. When Japanese were asked about their reparative attitudes regarding South Korea, trust of the Korean government also mediated affirmation and willingness to compensate. And trust mediated the relationship uh, between national identity affirmation and Japanese openness to take direct action for compensation in both the South Korean and Chinese conditions. So as you see here in the Chinese counterpart condition as well, trust of the Chinese government mediated how affirmation affected reparative attitudes. Thank you, Dr. Chung. Uh, we have a comment from Tom in the chat, and I just wanted to see if you wanted to comment on it too. It says, I'm looking forward to hearing about the use of your concepts to negotiations and negotiation styles. So when TPP fell apart, the role of Prime Minister Abe, a leader with a strong sense of national identity for sure, was a central player in creating the next stage of TPP minus US. You might look at a series of negotiations and see what the characteristics of a successful leader might be. Do you want to respond to that or? Yes, definitely. Thank you, uh, Tom, for your comment. This is incredibly helpful. And I would be very, very interested to uh, more closely examine the case of the TPP when I'm studying national identity affirmation effects on negotiation. Um, with uh, the, the example you gave in particular, I would be especially interested to see in the... Um, the kind of national identity that um, a former Prime Minister Abe was promoting. Um, was it purely inward looking or was it based on a sense of national greatness? Um, is it related to uh, a sense of othering, especially, for example, with regard to uh, China's rapid rise? Is it related to a perceived sense of threat um, coming from uh, China's rise? Um, and uh, so I would love to look at the case to see if this is, um, this can be a case of national identity affirmation and what effect that identity had there. Yeah, that sounds like a great suggestion. Um, Let's see, you know, since we are hosted here at CBA, the College of Business Administration and the Center for Business International Business Education, 
Um, I thought maybe we could talk about the business implications of your research. I would be happy to uh, try and answer that. <laughs> uh, let's see. And I'm and, definitely not a business. Yeah, yeah. But um, so my guess is that comparing my findings between the trust questions and the trust game might suggest some indirect insights into the business implications of my results. Since the trust game involves real monetary exchange between participants, how participants behave here might speak to the image and perceptions Koreans, Japanese, and Chinese people have of each other in doing business. So let me give you a quick description of how the trust game works first. The trust game involves a truster and a trustee. In my experiment, I paired people up with a foreign opponent so that they thought on a computer they were playing the game in real time online with someone in another country. So for example, if you were a Korean participant, you could be randomly paired with either a Chinese or a Japanese opponent. So altogether, we have two times three is six pairs. There are two stages to the trust game. The truster first has the choice of sending over tokens, anywhere from zero to 100 tokens to their foreign trustee. The interesting thing is that before this amount reaches the trustee, the amount is multiplied by three. So now the pie to share gets bigger. Once the trustee has received the amount of tokens the truster sent, times three, the trustee now has the option of sending whatever amount out of what they have back to the truster. And this is one round of the trust game. And what I'm interested in is the first amount the truster sends to the trustee, as this is what is supposed to represent trust of the other. I mean, you would only send some tokens to your opponent if you trust them to give some back to you, right? Mm -hmm. And in my findings, <laughs> um, let's see if we can go back to, um, here are the results. Um, and as you see, Chinese participants were the most trusting of other participants from other nationalities, but the least trusted, <laughs> And Koreans, on the other hand, were the least trusting. They gave the the less the the you know less tokens to their counterparts in, on average, um, but were more trusted. And Japanese were somewhere in between. Um, but I would definitely be interested in um, taking a closer look at these cross national comparisons in the future. Thank you. Um... It's been a pleasure talking with you. I'm gonna hand it over now to Professor Pak, who's gonna maybe ask a last question or close us out, but thank you. It's been really rewarding listening and, and learning more about your research today. Really a counterintuitive novel um, approach and findings. Thank you. Well, thank you so much, Professor Ramos, for leading such an intriguing conversation with uh, Professor Chong. And Professor Chong, thank you so much for talking to LMU community today out of your very busy schedule. Um, we really appreciate sharing with us your insights into these very complex and complicated issues. Um, before I wrap up this webinar, um, I just have a quick question for you. It's uh, not a difficult question. You know, Korea has achieved this remarkable economic success uh, that means but their national identity affirmation has been elevated. And why do you think they still uh, revisit this issue and um, keep asking Japanese government for, you know, um, compensation for all the things that um, 
uh, they've done in the past. Do you think it's just an issue of politicizing by some of these extreme national chauvinists? Or how you think the experimentation results that you had, it, you think it's really reflect the reality or is just a, one of the very first step to demonstrate that there's a way out um, and uh, leaving the you know past behind that um, these three countries can move forward and uh, to work together uh, for a much more common goal and uh, much more bigger cause. So I'm just curious about, to me, there still seems to be a, some kind of discrepancy between the, the research results you have and, and reality that uh, we live in. Thank you, Professor Peck. That is a, a, an excellent question. And I, um, so first of all, uh, let me just say that um, I think there is a, a sense of injury that um, indeed justifies the demand for compensation um, and, um, you know, a, a demand for post-conflict justice, definitely. Um, so there is that uh, continued demand. On the other hand, I also do think to some degree uh, the past is used and politicized, as you suggested, by elites who see this as a convenient tool, not just from the Korean side, but uh, probably from all three countries, uh, depending on the leader and the government at the time. Mm -hmm. um, a common, uh, a, um, a concept that we use in international relations, um, there's one called rally around the flag. So if you create an external enemy in another country, then that promotes domestic cohesion and internal public support for leaders. So creating some sort of some sense of common enemy in another country can be a convenient political tool, definitely. Okay. Um, with regard to whether the theory can have implications for real policy and the, the connect to the, these theoretical experimental findings and the real world, mm -hmm. um, I think that's an important question and something that I, we, that I and other scholars hopefully will continue to work on. I do think that the sense of national identity affirmation can be a first step if used at the right time as the right tool by the right leaders who have a motivation to promote cooperation and reconciliation rather than you know stick to the old old game of trying, you know, again, using uh, the past as a political tool. Um, so it's a theoretical bet. Um, I do hope that it can have some impact in real world politics, but I, I definitely don't see this as, you know, the panacea to all relations. It might be uh, what initiates the first step towards cooperation if there's um, that motivation in public opinion uh, that is shared by elites at the time. Okay. Great. Um, once again, your presentation was very informative and enlightening. And finally, I'd like to thank all of you who joined the webinar today. I hope that you have enjoyed the program and learn about something about the relationship between these three countries and the critical role that national identity can play to resolve some of these difficult issues from the past and move forward. When you leave this webinar, you will be asked to fill out a brief survey and I would really appreciate it if you can complete it. Thank you so much, everyone. Good night, good morning, and good afternoon, depending where you are. Thank you.